I'm going to talk today about a project that we did and just got published in ecological applications, uh, looking at the large scale forest restoration up in northern Arizona and the effects of forest carbon on that uh, particular project. Um, so if you guys are from the Southwest or from the Western US, this might be uh, kind of a no brainer for you. But if you're not from the Western US, um, it may be a little bit of a surprise that some of the news stories you see on uh, the news about California catching on fire is not just California, but most of the Western US has large wildfire hazard potential and could catch on fire. Um, and this is happening all over the Western US, including Arizona. Um, and most of this, while it could be due to increased drought conditions, a lot of it is due to the increased density of forests because of a century of wildfire suppression. So these are some really cool paired photographs that we have come across here in Arizona. This is the Kaibab National Forest. The top photograph is from 1875, showing the density of forests before we started suppressing fires in the area. And the bottom photograph is from 2004, after a century of fire, fire suppression. And you can see the increased density of trees in the same area. Uh, here's some other photographs. This one up here in the top left corner is 1923. And you have the same area in 1947 and then in 2005. And this is the Fort Valley Experimental Forest up by Flagstaff. And you can see the increasing density of forest as fire was suppressed in these areas. So in addition to the increased density from fire suppression, we do have increasing temperatures, decreasing uh, precipitation in the region. And we did an analysis of, uh, of the adapted, fire adapted forest in the Western US over here on the left hand side, the blue areas over here are the fire of the forests in the Western US that have been adapted with fire. So these are forests that frequently had fire run through them. So fire return intervals of less than 35 years and historically. And that's about 43% of the forests in the Western US that were adapted with fire. But over here on the right hand side, those red areas are those forests that were frequently had uh, were adapted with fire that are now either moderately or highly departed from their historic conditions. And that's 93% of those forests that are now uh, departed from their historic conditions and at risk for catastrophic wildfire. And if we zoom in here in Arizona, the dark green areas here are conifer forests in Arizona. And these orange areas here, orangish red areas here, are the areas where we've had um, fires in the last couple decades, including two of the largest uh, fires in state history uh, in Arizona. So in order to deal with this issue of overgrown forests and risk of catastrophic wildfire, the U.S. Forest Service began the Boar Forest Restoration Initiative, also known as Boar Fry. Um, and so the four forests are the gray boundaries you see here. And phase one of four fry, which is the black area there, is about a million acres. So four fry in total is about 2.4 million acres. Phase one, which is what we're going to talk about today, is about a million acres. The EIS for this project was approved in 2015, and it is the largest forest restoration project um, being undertaken by the U.S. Forest Service at this time. And the point of four fry was, of course, to reduce wildfire risk and improve wildlife habitat. But we wanted to ask the question, what would happen to the forest carbon in this area um, because of the four fry restoration and what would happen uh, under climate change projected over the next hundred years or so. So here's kind of the vegetation breakdown of what this area looks like. So most of the area is ponderosa pine. We do have some higher elevation <laughs> spruce fir, um, mixed conifer areas. There's some pinyon juniper along the lower elevations. Um, there's gamble oak in places throughout, and then there's some grassland patches. This is surrounding flagstaff, so there's some urban areas uh, in this region too. 
And for this project, we had four basic scenarios. Um, so this is about a million acres. We ran the um, simulations from 2010 to 2099. I'll start down here at the bottom. This is the fast four or fry scenario. This is how four or fry was planned um, to work. So it was supposed to be that 10 four or fry would uh, happen over the course of 10 years, 100% of the landscape would be treated in that 10 years, and then everything would be maintained with maintenance fires. So if that's the case, then 60,000 acres per year would initially be treated with thinning and about 35,000 acres per year would be treated with prescribed fires. So that's 10% of the landscape per year would be treated over the course of the 10 years and maintaining that same uh, level of treatment through maintenance fires would put us at about 35,000 acres per year of maintenance fires. We also wanted to ask the question, what would happen if they couldn't finish it in 10 years? So we did a moderate four or five scenario, and that would be that they would take them 20 years to treat the landscape initially. So that's 30,000 acres per year of initial thinning and 17,500 acres per year of prescribed fire, so treating 5% of the landscape per year and taking them 20 years to get that initial treatment done and then maintaining that with maintenance fires. Uh, we also threw in a scenario of status quo. So this is what was happening on the landscape before four fry, which was about 3,000 acres per year of initial thinning and about 9,000 acres per year of prescribed fire. And then we also have a fourth scenario in there, which is kind of a control or no harvest scenario. So we ran the simulations in the Landis 2 simulation model. And the way Landis works, if you're not familiar with it, is you have a main succession extension in there in which all the growth and uh, initial communities and things are input into that. And for that succession extension, we used NECN, which stands for Net Ecosystem Carbon and Nitrogen. And we use that particular succession extension because it tracks all of the carbon uh, pools and fluxes. And so you put all of your initial communities, your species parameters and everything into that excess succession extension. And then you can add on additional extensions extensions uh, to simulate disturbance. So for our disturbance extensions, we used the dynamic fuels and fire um, extension uh, to simulate wildfire, but because it only does wildfire, we did both thinning and prescribed fire in the biomass, biomass harvest extension. Um, we ran 10 replicates of each of our scenarios and we used multiple climate models. I'll discuss those climate models in just a second. So the input parameters into the succession model, the NECN part of it, is um, you have to set up eco-regions in the particular version that we used. And so you can set up eco-regions however you want, but you want it to simulate where things on the landscape would grow differently. So we used both soil texture and precipitation to simulate eco-regions. Those are over here on the right-hand side. And so we combined soil texture and precipitation into 14 different ecoregions. We also input the initial communities into the succession extension. And for those, we used um, the uh, Forest Service Common Stand Exam, which is the uh, input uh, data that the Forest Service used to develop their prescriptions for four fry. So we have actual age, we use those to develop age cohorts that were input into Landis. And we did this for 10 different species and we input species parameters for each of those 10 different species into Landis. Um, we use the dynamic fuels and fire extension for wildfire so that fuels are input on, into the model on the landscape. They can change with each time step. We had 12 pre-disturbance uh, fuel types, which were determined by the dominant vegetation, and five post-disturbance fuel types. Since you guys are fire people, so I went ahead and put down the specific fuel types were there in case you're interested. They're determined by the, or their input by the Canadian uh, fuel system. So uh, I didn't put all of the different input parameters, although there are lots of them in there, but they're basically determined by the dominant species that are on that 
in each individual cell and the dominant age of that species that are in the individual cell. And so the fuel type can change at each time step and it can change at each cell. So we have several different ones for ponderosa pine. We have some for mixed conifer, some for gamble oak, uh, some for aspen, things like that. And so if it's pre-disturbance, it's based off of this dominant veg uh, vegetation type. And then if it's post-disturbance, it's based off of how many years since that disturbance. And so um, what basically changes after the disturbance is the canopy to base height. Um, so if there's been a disturbance there, the canopy to base height of that fuel type changes and affects the fire severity. In addition to the fuel types, we also um, put in, uh, calibrated the model to fire size. So we used a fire atlas to look at the historical fire data over the past several decades in this region. And uh, you can see here our fire database data in the pink and then the calibration data out of Landis. And I will say that Landis inputs fire size data using a log normal distribution. So it allows you to input a mu and a sigma and then it pulls fire sizes based off of that log normal distribution. You can see here that our mean fire size from the fire um, database data is there and we have really large standard deviations from that fire size or from that fire database, which shows that there are several really large fires coming out of there. But the way that Landis inputs fire um, size, it pulls from that log normal distribution, which is really hard to replicate those really large fire sizes. So we decided to calibrate our um, model to total area burned per year instead of mean fire size. So we wanted to make sure that we were at least burning the same total area burned per year as what was happening uh, in historical time or in, in the past several decades. And so while we may be getting uh, the same of total area burned per year, it's likely happening over smaller uh, several small fires instead of um, a couple of large fires. Uh, we input harvest prescriptions from uh, that match the U.S. Forest Service prescriptions that were from Four Fry. So we got the prescription data from them. So there are 14 different prescriptions that were put in. 11 of them are harvest prescriptions. Um, they vary across the landscape and um, vary in the purpose of the prescription. They are um, things like intermediate thin, uneven age, stand improvement. Um, they vary in the amount of openness across the landscape. Um, the graph along the bottom shows the areas in red are the biomass removed from our model compared to the biomass removed expected from the US Forest Service. So we calibrated our model to try and match as best as possible the biomass that the Forest Service is expecting to remove from each prescription. So we're trying to match the input data, the inventory data from the Forest Service um, and the prescription data as best we can from the Forest Service to try and get as best we can the four or five prescriptions that are happening on the landscape. For the climate data, um, we used PRISM data for historical spin up and then we used four climate models. Um, and those climate models were chosen based on both their correlation with the historic period um, and to represent a range of future conditions. Uh, one of those climate models is down here at the bottom. You can see that um, in this particular climate model, by the time we get to the end of the decade, um, this is temperature is about 14 degrees. Um, average summer temperatures are about 14 degrees higher at the end of that decade than they were um, at the end of last decade. Oops. Um, and that the precipitation is about 22% less at the end of next decade than it was at the end of last decade. Um, that's just one of the four climate models. And we use these climate models for both growth and fire weather in the future. In addition to the Landis models, we also took outside of Landis, did a simple flow analysis to determine uh, what was happening to the harvested wood that was coming out of the forest and what kinds of products were being created from that wood to try and track the carbon 
uh, in those products and we wanted to track how much carbon was being used in the equipment being uh, that was transporting that wood and the equipment that was being used to harvest that wood to try and do a full cycle carbon analysis um, uh, to track all of the carbon in the wood. So here are some of the results and I'm going to be uh, mostly talking about this one uh, total ecosystem carb, this one climate model, just for simplicity's sake, but we do have results from all four of the climate models in the paper. I just for ease of presentation, I'll probably mostly be talking about this one. I will say that this one is about the intermediate level of carbon. You can see that there are some of these other models that show less carbon, some other models that show more carbon. This one's kind of the intermediate level and we'll be talking about this, this particular climate matter going forward. So the blue, this is total ecosystem carbon on the y-axis and year on the x-axis. The blue line here is four or five fast. The red line is four or five moderate. Uh, status quo is the black gray line and then the green line is no harvest. So this blue line is a 18% increase by the time we get to 2100 over the green line that equates to 12.7 million metric tons of carbon more on the landscape um, by the end of the century than you have in the no harvest model. And I'm gonna break this graph down into three major pieces and say first section is harvest and you can see that there's a loss in carbon in these red and blue lines over the first couple decades, the first 10 years in the blue line and the first 20 years in the red line. And then you have big gains in carbon over the mid part of the century in the red and the blue lines. Um, and I'll talk in the next couple of slides about where these gains are coming from. And then in the last part of the decade, you have decreases in carbon as these lines start to drop off. All the lines start to drop off in the last couple decades. Um, and this is when you start to get into those 14 degree increases in summer temperature and 22% loss of precipitation. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit too. So if we talk about these gains in carbon that are happening over the mid part of the century and why those gains are happening. So about 30% of that carbon increase can be explained by increases in growth or productivity on the trees that remain on the landscape post harvest. So this graph represents the cumulative NEP, so net ecosystem productivity. So this is the carbon that is gained from growth or productivity of the trees on the landscape. And it's a cumulative graph. So what you're looking at are the changes in slope of the lines of the red and the blue lines compared to the black and the green lines. And you can see that post harvest, so post 2020, post 2030 for the different lines, the slope of the red and the blue lines start to change from the black and the green lines. And this is because there's an increase in growth or productivity for the trees that remain on the landscape after the harvest has happened. And that explains about 30% of the carbon increase differences in the, um, in the four or five uh, scenarios. The other 70% of the increase can be explained in the differences in wildfire um, between the scenarios. So on the left here, you have cumulative wildfire emissions and the colors of these graphs have kind of flipped here. So the blue line and red lines are now on bottom here showing that they have lower wildfire emissions um, than the black and the green lines do. And most of this is due to wildfire severity. So you can see, I'll show a graph real quick here that shows wildfire size between these different scenarios, which does not vary between the scenarios very much, which means that most of the differences between these emissions is coming from the differences in wildfire severity. So on the right hand side over here, you have the percentage of burned area with the dark red colors representing um, high severity fires and the lighter pink colors representing low severity fires. So here in this bar is the no harvest scenario with the good portion of the burned area being darker colors or high severity fires. And over here on the right hand side, you have the fast four or five scenario with a good portion of the burned area being 
low severity fires. But the low severity fires are only killing young, small trees, but the high severity fires are killing almost all the trees and a lot of older trees producing a lot of wildfire emissions. And that's leading to the big differences between the carbon in those scenarios. And that's about 70% of the differences between those scenarios and the carbon. Um, another interesting thing to note is where these carbon differences are happening in which pools they're happening. So about half of the carbon increases are happening in the above ground live vegetation, but about 40% of those differences are happening in the soil pools. And the soil pools are much more stable, um, less susceptible to disturbance. Um, so it's a good thing that a, a good amount of this increase is happening in the soil pools and that not all of it is happening in the above ground live vegetation. So then if we go to this last part of the century here and the carbon losses part, and look at what's happening there. And again, this is the um, graphs I was telling you about before with the temperatures, we're getting to the last part of the decade here, 14 degree increases in um, Fahrenheit increases in summer temperatures by the last couple decades, 22% loss of precipitation by that point. And how that plays out with carbon on the landscape. So on the left hand side over here, you have net ecosystem carbon balance. So this is basically the carbon gained from growth minus the carbon lost from disturbance. So when the lines go above this red line, the landscape represents a sink, a carbon sink. And when the lines go below this red line, the landscape is a source of carbon to the atmosphere. And so you can see here, the blue line represents four fry fast and the green line represents no harvest. So in post harvest, in these middle parts of the decade, four fry fast is a sink of carbon. It's taking carbon out of the atmosphere. It's, it's, it's holding it in the landscape. Um, but the four fry fast is putting carbon out to the atmosphere. But by the time we get to this uh, end part of the decade here, because of both uh, decreases in growth because of the temperature and increases in fire weather, um, both of these scenarios are a source to the atmosphere. And so you have lower growth and increases in fire weather showing lower carbon and a source of carbon to the atmosphere. In addition to that, if we look over here on the right hand side, this is a ponderosa pine probability of establishment. So in the last couple decades, what you get is that the ponderosa pine probably the probability of establishment drops off quite a bit. And so we have the adult trees that are showing decreases in growth and lower productivity. Some of them are burning up more with fire weather because fire weather is increasing. And then there's lower um, probability of establishment decreasing um, that uh, the probability of new trees coming in. And all of that is leading to losses in biomass of trees and thus a, a, a likelihood that we're seeing a, a decline in the benefits of that um, uh, restoration by the time we get to the end of the century and those uh, higher temperatures but I will say that if we go back and look at these different climate models, that may not necessarily be the case in all of these climate models. We see these lines starting to decline, but some of these other climate models with maybe not such high uh, temperature increases and or some increases in precipitation don't necessarily show some of those drops up, drop offs. Some of them that show higher increases predicted in temperature show even greater increases and temperature. And I will note that what we have here are um, the RCP 8.5 climate models. So it's possible that if, if we are able to do some kind of climate change mitigation and not get to some of these high levels uh, of predictive temperatures that maybe we wouldn't see some of these declines. Um, our harvested carbon analysis showed that only about 5% of the carbon that was removed from the forest remained sequestered by 2100. Um, that equ equated to about 200,000 metric tons of carbon that stayed uh, on the forest. 
or that stayed sequestered in wood products, but it took us about 140,000 metric tons to get that wood out of the forest to begin with. So we kind of broke even. Um, and that's mostly because about half of the product that's being produced from the wood coming out of this forest is, is being used to create wood pallets, which have a really low carbon half-life. Um, it's because it's small diameter wood that doesn't have much value. Um, if we were able to produce some kind of product that had a, lo a longer carbon half-life, it's possible that we could um, up these numbers and extend the amount of carbon that's sequestered in products longer. So uh, in summary, uh, the four or five fast scenario showed that about 12 million metric tons more carbon um, ended up on the landscape than the no harvest scenario. This equates to about 110,000 cars per year uh, being removed from the road every year until 2100. Um, nearly half of those increases were in the soil carbon, um, but it's possible if we have uh, increases, uh, you know, in summer temperatures uh, or increases in temperatures and decreases in precipitation that climate change could diminish the effects of the restoration by the time we get to the end of the century. And if you go back to thinking about this from the perspective of the entire West, the amount of forests that are at risk for burning up in catastrophic wildfire and or the amount of forests that are in need of restoration and the amount of benefit you could get carbon-wise in addition to um, reducing the risk of catastrophic wildfire um, from restoration projects, you could start seeing some huge carbon benefits, um, you know, at the entire scale of the Western US from, from uh, uh, restoration projects. So just a few acknowledgements from some funding sources. Uh, the Forest Service helped us out a bunch with giving us a lot of data to help us out uh, with running this with all of their prescriptions and their inventory data. We had some help from Campbell Global that helped us out with telling us what kind of products were being produced. And then Rob Scheller and Will Flatley and Matt Herto helped us out with Landis help um, and with all of their projects that they were working on. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was a great presentation. Um, obviously, there's a lot of details in some of those figures and, and some of the modeling work. Um, but I think, at least for me, you gave a good level um, enough so that I felt like I understood it, um, but not too much, uh, so that I, I lost, lost the track. Um, <clears throat> so feel free to put questions in the chat window. Uh, I'm just gonna note that here. We also were, were fortunate just to have not too many folks on the line. So if you wanna unmute yourself, um, feel free to do that. Uh, let's see, is there anyone just on the phone? Uh, yeah, I can unmute people too if you um, if you need that help. Um, but you can ask your questions verbally if you'd like. Um, so while we're waiting for other folks, I'll abuse my privilege as moderator and ask a question. Um, I got a little confused. So you have a chart um, uh, where you look at whether uh, the four fry area is a net carbon um, source or sink. Um, over time and you have the blue line for, yeah, that, yeah. What, yeah, that one. So looking at this one, um, it, uh, it, what I, what I missed was this in comparison with say the next total ecosystem carbon where there's sort of this dramatic difference between the scenarios um, and the, the current graph we're looking at where they particularly sort of towards the end of the century, they, they line up uh, significantly. So do you mind, maybe you've said this already, yeah. it, but do you mind reminding Yeah, so me? total ecosystem carbon is kind of a cumulative value. So it's adding up carbon over each year to, and then summing it. So, and this is an annual value. So it's a flux happening every year as opposed to a pool summing up 
for and adding up what was there last year. So it's a little bit difficult to compare between the two. Um, so this is kind of like what is fluxed out every year. So this is, um, you know, the carbon lost every year. And, and so it, this is one of the reasons it changes so often is because it's a carbon flux going in and out of the atmosphere versus a pool. Um, so maybe th uh, that, that really helps. And, and I see my un misunderstanding, but just diving in a little more deeply, um, the, uh, in that no harvest scenario, it seems like one of the issues is loss due to high severity fire. Um, mm -hmm. you, do you, s is, is that showing up? Would that show up as part of the annual flux, like in a given yeah, year? Yeah, so, so every time this green line falls below the red here, it causes this green line to go down more. If this green line stayed right at zero, it would probably make this green line stay flat. Okay. okay. Does that makes sense. Thank you. Yes. And so okay. every time this blue line stays above zero, it causes this blue line to go higher and higher. Okay. Okay. So one, it, would it? So, sorry to beat a dead horse here, but yeah. Uh, going back to the previous slide, uh -huh. um, where it drops below, uh, I know the in the model the sort of wildfires are probably stochastic, but is it for the layman um, reasonable to think about some of those big spikes downwards being um, a loss from a wildfire? It is. It's probably both wildfire and a really poor year of productivity because of weather or something. Yeah. And so often it could be it could be a poor year because it's a really hot, dry year, so there's a big fire, but that also coincides with a hot, dry year causing poor productivity or something too. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Fascinating. Um, well, I don't want to take up uh, yeah. <laughs> everybody's time. Um, are there other questions out there? Um, maybe I'll, I don't, I don't want to unmute everybody because sometimes folks have stuff going on in the background, but, but do feel free to speak up um, or, or put a question in. And um, if there aren't questions, we can, we can wrap up a little early. No, no reason to keep people on the line. Um, Maybe one one last question: Is there you you in your bio um, there was sort of some reference to other work um, around the four fry and some modeling stuff? Are there follow on papers that that are kind of in progress that um, kind of follow some maybe the water story or other elements of this larger picture? Yeah, we're looking at um, some additional. Um, ways Atlantis doesn't do the best it doesn't well it doesn't actually do drought mortality at all in in here so none of these trees are dying because of drought um, so we're trying to figure out uh, how to input drought mortality into Landis we're trying to also figure out um, how drought is affecting the way ponderosa pine trees are growing and how forest restoration is affecting uh, ponderosa pine growth in the region. So we've been working um, with USGS on, uh, and John Bradford at USGS on both of those questions and are hoping at some point to be able to pull that whole story together into Landis and make sh and um, make sure that Landis is is a is doing growth and mortality um, as as well as we think it should be. Um, you know, it's kind of difficult when you put these models all together because um, it does some things better than others, but it does everything, so it can't do everything well. You know, um, right. so um, we're trying to figure out what it's doing well and what it isn't doing well and ways we can improve um, what it isn't doing well. And maybe along those lines, Sean typed in a question asking whether the scenarios relate vegetation species composition over time. 
In other words, do the total ecosystem carbon, uh, does it relate to the existing species or is there some change over time, others in addition? Um, uh, and this, this might help uh, understand carbon flux depending on the species mix, I guess. So we, we can track species composition changes over time. We didn't, because we only ran this out to 2100, we didn't see a huge shift in species composition. Um, if we could reliably run this out, say several hundred years, it's possible we could see a shift in species composition. I don't, um, I don't know what that would be because we didn't run it out that long, nor do I know if I would trust the model to run it out, you know, four or 500 years and trust that it would do, do well. I mean, you would assume with the Prandorosa prime probability establishment dropping off, um, that it's possible that some other species could then move into its place and that, that, that um, there would be some species um, composition change, how that would affect the total ecosystem carbon is hard to say. Um, but we did not see much of a change in species composition just running it out to 2100. I do have some graphs in the supplemental information of the paper that show the species composition changes through time. Um, you can see that there was some slight increases in gamble oak um, by the time you got to 2100 and uh, some slight changes in ponder decreases in ponderosa pine, um, but it really wasn't um, um, much of a change. Great. Uh, yeah, and Sean typed in, wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, well, great. I think maybe with that, um, we should wrap things up. Again, I, I really want to thank you for, for sharing your research. It, um, I get so much more out of someone like yourself explaining your own paper clearly rather than me trying to read it. So thank you for taking the time. I, I, again, I think this is really important for those of us working in forest restoration across the country. So um, with that, I will um, shut down the meeting and um, I'll share the recording uh, once I have it. Okay, thank you.